Heavenly Father, I ask your help this morning. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to make your word come alive, Lord. Help me present your son, Jesus, to lift him high, that all might see him and be saved. I ask it all in his holy name. Amen. Amen. The gospel today is very different than the gospel on Christmas Eve. We don't have any shepherds. We don't have any angels. We don't have any animals in the manger. What we have here is a theological poem written in Greek by the Apostle John. It's very simple Greek. In fact, the Greek of the Gospel of John is so simple, you can learn New Testament Greek just by using it as a study guide. In fact, at home I have a study guide based on introducing people to New Testament Greek who don't know a word in New Testament Greek and using the Gospel of John. You can tell that Greek was not his first language. He was a Jew. His first language was Aramaic. So, why did John write his gospel? We often think that the gospels just kind of appeared out of nowhere or they came down from heaven, but that's not how they happened. The gospel of Matthew, Matthew's not even his real name. His real name is Levi or Levi. And apparently he was a renegade Levite who was collecting taxes for the Romans when he met Jesus. And Jesus restored him. And he took a nickname, Matthew, which in Aramaic means gift of God. And the Gospel of Matthew is the most Jewish of all the Gospels. In fact, he organizes it around five discourses so that Jesus is the new Moses. The five discourses in the Gospel of Matthew like the five books of Moses in the Old Testament. And Matthew was the most quoted Gospel in the early church by the church fathers. But the interesting thing is the Gospel of Mark, which is the shortest Gospel, 99% of it is repeated in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. So it's pretty obvious that both Matthew and Luke had the Gospel of Mark to work with. And the Gospel of Mark, according to the early church, was based on the preaching of Peter in Rome. And if you read the Gospel of Mark carefully, you can see it's divided up into little paragraphs, preaching notes that Peter used in Rome. And then we have the non-Jew, the Greek Dr. Luke, and his Gospel. And there's a lot of stuff in Luke that's not in the other Gospels. For instance, the whole story about Jesus' birth. The angels, the shepherds, the Annunciation, the angel appearing to Mary, the birth of John the Baptist, that's all in the Gospel of Luke. It's not in any other Gospel. You often, sometimes I think Luke was thinking ahead to all the Christmas pageants that the church would have in 2,000 years. So he... You know, he had to add this stuff because Matthew and Mark didn't talk about this. And, well, how did Luke find all this out? Well, remember that Luke was a convert of the Apostle Paul. They met somewhere in Turkey, only there were no Turks in Turkey at that time. The Turks came in the Middle Ages. What was Turkey then was called Asia Minor, and it was full of Greeks and Syrians and Phrygians and Lydians and who knows what. But Luke was a Greek doctor. He came to Christ through the ministry of the Apostle Paul and became his fervent friend and loyal companion. In fact, at 2 Timothy, when Paul is getting ready to be executed, he says, everybody's abandoned me, only Luke is with me. So how did Luke find out all this stuff about Mary and John the Baptist and the birth of Jesus? There's other stuff in Luke that's not in any other gospel. The prodigal son, the good Samaritan, Zacchaeus, the little guy who had to climb up on the sycamore tree because he couldn't see Jesus. That's all in Luke. 
Well, Paul was in prison, if you remember. He was in prison in Jerusalem and Caesarea. And what is a Greek doctor who was trained in classical Greek, because the Greek in the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts is the best Greek in the New Testament, what is a classical trained Greek doctor supposed to do while Paul's cooling his heels in prison? Well, he investigates. He goes up and down Israel. He, he does interviews with John the Baptist's family. He does interviews with Mary's family. And that's how we know all this stuff. And he writes the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts like a Greek historian, like Thucydides or Polybius. And now we come to John. Why did John write another gospel? Because almost everything in the gospel of John is not in the other gospels. All those famous I am sayings, I am the good shepherd, I am the door of heaven. Even that one where I will prepare a place for you in heaven so that where I go you too may come. That's all in John. It's not in the other gospels. There's a lot of very interesting eyewitness details in the Gospel of John. That famous breakfast on the shore of the Sea of Galilee after the resurrection, when the apostles are out trying to fish again. You know, maybe they thought, well, maybe we better go back to our old job since, you know, Jesus has died. And there's this guy on the shore saying, have you caught anything? And Peter's starting to think, this sounds familiar. And he said, no, we haven't caught anything. Well, why don't you go out a little further and pour the nets out again? And Peter's going, this is getting very familiar. And they throw the nets out and they take in 153 fish. Now, for the life of me, I can't figure out a symbolic or mystical meaning to the number 153. Apparently, John was there, and it was such a big haul, he counted the fish. <laughs> and when Jesus is dying on the cross, most of the last words we have of Jesus are in the Gospel of John, because John was there. Remember what Jesus said to John? Take care of my mother. That's only in the Gospel of John. So we have the aged Apostle John in Ephesus taking care of Mary, Jesus' mother. There's already Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What do we need another gospel for? Well, there's several reasons. One is, the other guys left out a lot of stuff that John saw with his own eyes. And the Gospel of John claims to be an eyewitness account. But secondly, toward the end of the first century, heresy had already begun to enter into the church. Now, most people nowadays have trouble believing that Jesus is God, that he's divine. It wasn't like that in the first century. Most people had trouble believing that he actually became a human being and that he was flesh and blood like we are. Because the Greeks believed that the human body was bad. It falls apart. And now that I'm old, I know that's true. The Greeks were right. My body is falling apart. Every day I find a new part of my body that doesn't work anymore, or doesn't work like it used to. I can't eat pizza like I did when I was young because then I'll get heartburn and I won't sleep at night. There's a saying that says, if you're over 50 and you wake up in the morning and nothing hurts, it means one of two things. <laughs> Either you're still asleep or you're dead. <laughs> so the Greeks are right. This human body falls apart. It's worthless. It's full of passions, too. It makes us do stupid things like overeat and get sick and other stupid things which I won't mention. So the Greeks had a very low opinion of the human body. The Jews didn't. The Jews considered the human body a gift from God. They considered it sacred. That's why you couldn't mutilate it. 
But by the end of the first century, a lot of Jews had been heavily influenced by Greek philosophy. In fact, John uses a Greek philosophical term in his poem, the logos, the word. So the apostle John is thinking, not only did Matthew, Mark, and Luke leave out a lot of good stuff, especially the stuff in Judea. By the way, the foot washing is only in the Gospel of John. If he didn't repeat the words of institution, why? It's already in the other Gospels. He didn't repeat the birth of Jesus. Luke did a pretty good job with that, so why repeat it? But he had to defend the reality that Jesus is the divine word of God who came to earth as a real human being with real flesh and blood. Listen to what he writes in his first letter. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes and which we have looked upon and our hands have touched of the word of life. They touched Jesus. He was real. He ate fish with them on the shore of Galilee. Ghosts and spirits don't eat fish. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show to you that eternal life, which was with the Father. Where did Jesus come from? The Father. And was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Now, this word logos, or word, it was a technical word. It was used in Greek philosophy. It was used by the Jewish philosopher Philo in Alexandria to somehow explain how the infinite God could somehow have a relationship with the finite world. Because, you know, you can't take a picture of an infinite God who is infinite spirit and who's everywhere in the universe. How do you do that? That's why there's no images of Yahweh or the Father. It's ridiculous to think you can do that. In Spain, in the newspaper, they always showed uh, God the Father as an old guy with a long white beard and a triangle floating above his head, which I thought was pretty stupid. If you're an infinite spirit, no one can make a picture of you. No one can even grasp what that is. So, the Greek philosophers invented a second God, an inferior God. Actually, they had a whole chain of them because they really believed that the one pure God couldn't touch human flesh. It's so icky, you know. If you've ever had a baby, they're very icky. They poop all over themselves. And Christians believed that the word of God became an icky baby who pooped all over himself and probably vomited on the Virgin Mary? No, that can't be true. So they had the logos. The infinite pure spirit can somehow relate to the material word, world through the logos. And Philo even adopted that because he was heavily influenced by Greek thought. And he was trying to get the Greeks to become Jews, so he was trying to help them slowly but surely come into Judaism. So, John writes a theological poem in Greek. And he uses the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, the logos. But he goes further and says, the word was God. He wasn't a second God, an inferior God. He was the same God. He was in the beginning with God, meaning the Father. And listen to this. All things were made through him. He's thinking of Genesis chapter 1. What does Genesis chapter 1 say? God said, and it happened. The word of God created the universe. Without him was not anything made that was made. Now, my wife and I have gotten addicted 
to a soap opera. It's a very unusual soap opera. It's about ultra-Orthodox Jews living in Jerusalem, in the old city. All the men are rabbis. They all have long, white, long beards and side curls, and all they do all day is read the Talmud and the Torah, while the women cook the food and have the babies. Now the women, once they're married, have to cover their heads. At home, they put some kind of net over their heads. You can't see their hair. If they go out in public, they wear a wig. We've watched this so much, I've been thinking about growing side curls. <laughs> and I've been thinking about buying a black wig for Ninfa to wear when she goes out in public. <laughs> so nobody will see her real hair, which is, I'm only the guy. I'm the only one who's supposed to see that. But apparently not all the time, just on special occasions when they procreate. So, but there's something fascinating about these people and beautiful. Every time they eat or drink anything, even if it's just a little glass of Coca-Cola, they say, Lord God of the universe, thank you. Through your word, everything came into being. Through your word, everything came into being. John's writing in Greek, very elemental Greek. He's using a Greek term, logos, but he's also thinking about grace. Through your word, everything that exists came into being. And who is that word? Jesus is that word. He is the word through whom everything came into being. And he goes on. In him was life, and the life was the light of human beings. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light. Remember that John was originally a disciple of John the Baptist, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. If there's light anywhere in this world, it's from Jesus. People may not acknowledge it. They may not know the name Jesus or Yeshua or Issa. But every light that is in the world comes from him. Why? Because he is the divine Logos. He is the word of God. Now the way this is translated into Spanish is very interesting. There's two words for word. There's an ordinary word which they use in the modern translations, they say, Jesus es la palabra de Dios. En el comienzo estaba la palabra, y la palabra estaba con Dios, y la palabra era Dios. La palabra es un, it's a common word. You can call the words of my sermon palabras. But in the old translations into Spanish, the Reina Valera, which was made in the 16th century by a Spanish Protestant, who was the first Bible translated from the original languages in Spanish in the 16th century. He uses the word el verbo. Jesus is the verb of God. He's not just an ordinary run-of-the-mill word. He is the verb of God. Can you make a sentence without a verb? No. You can have a Polish last name without vowels, I know that. But you can't write a sentence without a verb. Jesus is the verb of God. He's how Yahweh, the Father, does everything. He does it through the word, through the verb. And John has the audacity to say to the heretics at the end of the first century, Yes, yes, 
the Logos, the divine Logos came to earth and was a messy, smelly baby and grew up and became a human being and he was tortured and crucified and rose from the dead and he united us to himself so that as he says, the high priestly prayer is only in the Gospel of John. We are one with the Word as the Word is one with the Father. If the incarnation isn't true, then we're not united to Christ and we're not united to God. That's what he's saying. There's a famous story about him in the early church because he lived to be a very old man. He was going to the public baths in Ephesus and the heretic who was teaching that Jesus did not come in the flesh was also in the public baths. As soon as he heard that, he got out of the water and left the baths. He was not going to be in the same water as that man who was denying the truth of the incarnation. That word literally in Latin means to be put into flesh. Carne, carnal, put into flesh. Now, how do we get this? It's true. It's a fact. It's not mysticism. It's not symbolism. I have a book at home written by a Jewish Orthodox rabbi from Germany who believes in the physical resurrection of Jesus. He didn't become a Christian, but he decided that Jesus or Yeshua was the way Gentiles get saved. And he said he contradicted Boltmann and all the German biblical critics who were supposedly Christians who said, oh, no, he didn't really rise physically. It was a spiritual thing. And this Jewish Orthodox rabbi said, you're all full of it. No self-respecting Jew is going to believe in a spiritual resurrection. Either he's resurrected or he's not whether he's flesh and blood or he's not flesh and blood. That's from a Jew. Let's go on in the poem. He was in the world. The world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Verse 12, very important to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right or the power, because that word can be translated two different ways, he gave the right to become children of God. So how do you become a child of God? You have to be born again. Nicodemus is only in the Gospel of John. The Samaritan woman at the well is only in the Gospel of John. You have to be born again. You have to be born another time. Because the first time you're born, you were born of blood or the will of the flesh. A lot of babies are born of the will of the flesh, right? Or the will of man. But those who believe in his name and receive him, meaning the divine Logos, Jesus, the man who's also God, you get the right and the power to become a child of God and have eternal life. But you have to do it. You have to believe in him and you have to receive him into your heart and into your soul and into your life. This is not something that happens naturally. This is not something everybody has. If everybody already had it, then Jesus didn't need to come. He didn't need to die on the cross. The Apostle John didn't have to write another gospel. You have to receive him in order to receive eternal life. Because only he has it. The Jews are right. There is only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one and only one. But the divine word is also God. 
and part of the Godhead. And only through him can we be united with the Father. Chapter 8, the Gospel of John. He's the only one who reports this. He scandalizes the Pharisees. Before Abraham was, I am. I am is Yahweh. I am is what Yahweh said in the burning bush. The Pharisees immediately recognized what he was claiming, divinity. He was more than divinity, he was claiming to be Yahweh. Yahweh come to earth? How can that happen? How can God be crucified on a cross? How can God be whipped to an inch of his life because of the incarnation? So John wanted to make sure we didn't forget that. This poem, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. This poem, 18 verses, summarizes the whole New Testament and all the other Gospels. This is what it's all about. It's not a boring theological poem. Yeah, we don't have the shepherds and the angels and the manger, but this is what it was all about. This is what really happened on Christmas. God came down to earth so he could bring us up to heaven. Amen.